Hello everyone, welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Well, this question has been posed a lot to me frequently and I figured that this is a good time to do a video on this. Now we know that the United States Supreme Court in the case of New York Pistol and Rifle Association v. Bruin struck down some very oppressive concealed carry laws in the state of New York. But the bigger issue in that case, the much bigger issue in that case, was the very clear rule of law that the Supreme Court announced as how we will analyze gun control legislation moving forward. And that has many people wondering what other gun laws might be on shaky grounds now. So today we're going to have to spend a few minutes and talk about, did the Supreme Court just shoot down waiting periods? Okay, so the issue we're talking about was actually brought to my attention by one of our loyal viewers, Dave A. Dave A, I know you're out there and watching this video, and I want to thank you for this idea. He sent me a private email. He and I had a little bit of an exchange about it, had a pretty good conversation. He shared with me some other videos that he had seen, and I thought, hey, you know, this is a pretty good idea. Let's do a video on it. The issue is... In Washington State, back in 2018, we had a little old initiative called Initiative 1639. Now, that was sold to the public as a way to more strictly regulate semi-automatic rifles and various other safety measures, which would, of course, save lives. Now, many people did not realize that one of the things that Initiative 1639 had in it, and there were a multitude of things that it had in it, but was a new provision which reestablished a new statute in Washington law, RCW 9.41.092, which is our mandatory waiting period. See, in Washington state, like many other states, when you go to purchase a firearm, there is a waiting period, and that is there is a period of time which you must wait before you can actually take receipt of the firearm. Okay, now we know about the holdings of New York Pistol and Rifle Association v. Bruin, and while certainly a lot of people focused on the rather oppressive concealed carry laws coming out of the state of New York, the bigger rule of law, and we have talked about it in a couple of these videos here already, the bigger rule of law was the very clear announcement of what is the analysis moving forward for any appellate court when we take a look at gun control legislation. You see, even though the United States Supreme Court had clearly stated in both Heller and McDonald that only a strict scrutiny analysis was to be used, all of the circuit courts, including the Ninth Circuit, have been applying an intermediate scrutiny analysis. So you ask yourself, okay, what's the difference between these two analyses? Well, again, without getting too far into the weeds and boring you to death, a strict scrutiny analysis is very simple. We look at the proposed gun legislation and we ask ourselves, does this legislation infringe upon activity which is traditionally protected by the Second Amendment, especially when we take a look at the text and history of the Second Amendment? And under a strict scrutiny analysis, that is the only question to be asked. And if the answer to it is, yes, it does infringe upon this type of activity, then the law is per se unconstitutional. Now, with an intermediate scrutiny analysis, yes, the court will go through the first part, which once again is does the legislation infringe upon an activity which is traditionally protected by the Second Amendment? But then there is a second question, and that question is, does the government interest outweigh the rights of the individual such that the legislation remains constitutional? And it is this second part of the test that every single court of appeal, that every single state Supreme Court has used to uphold many of these restrictive gun legislation. What's happening now is the United States Supreme Court has basically said, hey, listen, we get this two-part analysis. It's kind of cute, but it goes one step too many because this is the only question that should be asked moving forward. What that means is that Sylvester V. Becerra and any other case that was decided in this time period prior to New York Pistol and Rifle Association v. Bruin is likely decided on faulty legal grounds. I do anticipate that there will be immediate actions both in the state of California as well as possibly here in Washington to have a significant revisit of statutory mandatory waiting periods. Well, what should not come as a surprise to any of you who've been watching this channel for a while now is that the whole idea 
for mandatory statutory waiting periods comes from, that's right, California. And California actually passed a waiting period prior to Washington State. Is, of course, our, as we know, our governor and attorney general rapidly wants to try to imitate California. And so along came Initiative 1639. Now, California Penal Code 26815 is the California equivalent of 941092. Now, that was passed in 2018 and, of course, was immediately subject to a lawsuit. Okay, l let me try to get you to understand a little historical perspective here of Sylvester V. Becerra. So, California Penal Code 26815 gets passed, 10-day mandatory waiting period. Sylvester sues Becerra. The Attorney General says, hey, this law is unconstitutional. At the trial level, Sylvester wins. Sylvester wins, and the court rules that this waiting period is unconstitutional. The court, however, applied that intermediate scrutiny analysis that we previously talked about that was struck down. So they applied the wrong analysis, but they came to the right conclusion. Now, the state of California countered with all sorts of data and evidence saying all oh, these cooling off periods are really what's necessary. It saves lives. It, it, it stops rash decisions, and we need these cooling off periods. And the trial court very correctly analyzed the data and said, you know, your data doesn't prove any of the points that you're trying to make. So, um, and you also are grouping everybody into this, which means you're grouping CCW holders as well as other folks. CCW holders have already been through a stringent background check, especially in California. And so why should they be subjected to these same mandatory waiting periods? Now, of course, the state of California, as we all know, never likes losing. And when you got the Ninth Circuit sitting on the back end of things, hey, why not appeal? Because they oftentimes will save the day. So that's exactly what the state of California did. They appealed it to the Ninth Circuit. And lo and behold, not quite shockingly, the Ninth Circuit flipped the trial court's decision and reinstated the waiting periods. Now, how did they deal with the fact that the data didn't support any of California's position? They dealt with it the way they often do, and they just brushed it aside. They said, well, even though it doesn't prove anything, it's common sense that waiting periods would obviously save lives. These cooling off periods are essential to ensure that we don't have mass shootings. And so therefore, because of common sense, this law survives constitutional scrutiny. In affirming California's waiting periods, the Ninth Circuit, of course, applied that intermediate scrutiny analysis again, one which has now been soundly rejected by the United States Supreme Court, and said, although this certainly does infringe upon some of the rights of Sylvester, when we compare that to the interest of society and the governmental needs that are in play to save lives, to secure our safety, we believe that the regulation and the need for the regulation, the purpose for the regulation, outweighs any infringement upon the individual, and therefore it stands. And this is the exact rule of law how all of these crazy gun laws have withstood a constitutional test to date. Of course, Sylvester then appealed to the United States Supreme Court on a writ of certiorari. Unfortunately, the United States Supreme Court denied review and therefore the holdings of the Ninth Circuit became the final ruling of the case. Now, Justice Thomas, talk about turnaround, it's fair play. Justice Thomas wrote a scathing opinion where he was critical of the Ninth Circuit and all the other circuit courts for applying this intermediate scrutiny analysis because he was clear that in Heller and McDonald, it is a strict scrutiny analysis that must be applied. Well, come full circle, when Justice Thomas finally got his chance to get his claws into a Second Amendment case, as he did in Bruin, he very clearly and definitively stated once and for all, let there be no debate, that a strict scrutiny analysis is the only analysis to be used when analyzing the constitutionality of gun control legislation. Listen, you may have more questions about your waiting periods or anything else related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com. Or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember, part of being a lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.